If you love me, keep my commands. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever. The Spirit of Truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him. For he lives with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Before long, the world will not see me anymore. But you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. On that day, you will realize that I am in my Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. Whoever has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me. The one who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I too will love them and show myself to them. Then Judas, not Judas Iscariot, said, But Lord, why do you intend to show yourself to us and not to the world? Jesus replied, Anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. My Father will love them, and we will come to them and make our home with them. Anyone who does not love me will not obey my teaching. These words you hear are not my own. They belong to the Father who sent me. All this I have spoken while still with you. But the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. You heard me say, I am going away and am coming back to you. If you loved me, you would be glad that I am going to the Father, for the Father is greater than I. I have told you now, before it happens, so that when it does happen, you will believe. I will not say much more to you, for the Prince of this world is coming. He has no hold over me, but he comes so that the world may learn that I love the Father and do exactly what my Father has commanded me. Come now, let us leave. Well, good morning, everybody. Thank you very much for the welcome. It's a great privilege to be here. When I left um, my church, which we tried to do as well as we could, I found myself as a layman visiting many churches, and uh, many things were done so badly that I wrote an article for the Anglican magazine called Southern Cross, which was called, Are We Shooting Ourselves in the Foot?, where I really talked about how if we do things badly, let's say on Sundays, we can't be surprised if people don't really want to come and don't want to bring. And um, I just am very thankful for the way in which uh, you do things here. So um, maybe it's been like this forever, or maybe you've had a new injection of um, stuff, but it's very, uh, very encouraging indeed. I'm going to pray a short prayer again, a prayer that I've often prayed uh, before preaching, so let's bow our heads one more time and pray. Our gracious God, we thank you for these uh, few minutes that we have, and we pray that you would be our helper, that what is said would be faithful and loving, and that we would be good hearers and doers. And what we know not, please teach us. And what we have not, please give to us. And what we are not, please make us, for Jesus' sake. Amen. Is this fan... It's just tapping, which makes me feel impatient. <laughs> I keep going. Um, dear friends, I don't know if you've ever heard the story of the police cadets who are doing an exam, and the first question says something like this. You're traveling with your fellow officer in the vehicle, 
and you come across a huge accident, about eight cars have pranged into one another, and a huge crowd has gathered. Uh, one of the cars has hit a fire hydrant and uh, water is pouring into the air. Uh, there's obviously a couple of people been injured, and in the crowd, a large dog has just bitten a small boy, and a young man has just run away with a lady's handbag. Uh, people have begun to loot the shop, which has hit the front, of been hit by the car, and uh, in the far distance, you see uh, smoke appearing on the third floor of a nearby building. Question, what is your first course of action? And one of the cadets wrote, carefully remove uniform and mingle with crowds. <laughs> and uh, it, it is a fantastic response, isn't it, when everything just gets too difficult. And there's a certain time where you're a Christian and you think it would be probably best for me if I just bunkered down, lived privately and quietly, went to my church, sang my songs and didn't do much more. But what we see in John 14, 15, 16 is that Jesus says, not only have I looked after your long-term prospects, but I'm going to use you in the short term. And uh, that's what we're going to really look at in these chapters. And you've got the text in your booklets and you've got the outline if you could try and find it. Um, so the Last Supper has just uh, taken place and uh, Jesus is teaching his disciples that everything is under control and it is as if, listen carefully to this, he puts the telescope out into the long term and says, I've fixed your future. And then he brings the telescope in a bit and he says, I'm equipping you for the present. The present is going to be okay and the future is certainly okay. So I've called this first talk, The Advantages of Light and Life. And first of all, you'll see that the, the point number one is preparation for the next world. Now, I don't know if you've ever noticed this, but at the Last Supper, when Jesus says, in my Father's house are many rooms, which you will have heard many times if you've ever been to a funeral, these words do not actually appear in a funeral. Jesus is answering a question from Peter. Peter has just spoken up at the end of chapter 13 and said, where are you going? In other words, you shouldn't be leaving. We, we want you to stay. And Jesus says, well, where I'm going, you can't come. Obviously, I'm going to the cross. And Peter says, well, you know, remember, of course I can. In fact, um, we, we, we'll solve all your problems. And Jesus says, don't let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. I've told you that I go to prepare a place for you. And so those verses in John 14 are a correction to Peter. Because Peter is a DIY type of guy who says, we'll solve your problems, Jesus. We're, we're great. Just leave it to us. And Jesus says, no, you're not that great. Leave it to me. I will do what you cannot do. So he is basically dealing with the first question from Peter. And then the second question pops up, uh, and this is from Thomas. By the way, I don't know if you've ever noticed this before, but when Jesus says, I go to prepare a place for you, he doesn't mean, I go up to prepare a place for you. I wonder if you've ever thought this. I wonder if you've ever thought when Jesus says, in my Father's house are many rooms, I go to prepare a place for you. He means I'm going to go up and I'm going to make a little room for you. I'm going to get out the hammer and the nails and the wallpaper and the carpet and I'm going to make a little room for you up there. No, no, Jesus says, I go to prepare a place for you and you know the way that I'm going. And he's talking about the cross because if he goes to the cross, there will be a place for every believer. If he goes out, you will go in. If he gets the exit, you'll get the entrance. If he gets banished, you'll get welcomed. And so he's teaching Peter, don't trust yourself, I will do this job for you. And then Thomas speaks up and he's got his own question in verse 5. He says, um, we don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? So he's not like Peter, 
Peter is, trust me, Jesus, I'm, I'll fix everything. Thomas is, this is absolutely useless. This is pointless. This will never work. He's a pessimist. And Jesus comes back with the famous answer, verse 6, no, I'm the way. I'm the truth. I'm the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. We often use 14.6, don't we, in the face of people who think there are many ways where Jesus says, no, I'm the way. And that's absolutely right. But in context, Thomas is saying, this isn't going to work at all. And Jesus says, no, I am the way. And I am the truth and I am the life. When we tell people, my friends, that uh, there is only one way, there's nothing unloving about that. Once you've been persuaded that Jesus has risen and gone through the grave and is the way through the grave, there's nothing unloving about saying to your friend, go to him. If you're in a burning building and you know there's only one unlocked door, there's nothing unloving about pushing people towards the unlocked door. If you're on the Titanic and you know that all the lifeboats have got holes in them and will go nowhere, but one is secure, there's nothing unloving about pushing people to that lifeboat. When we urge people to Jesus, it's because we're persuaded that he is the one who goes through the grave. That's the loving thing to do. And that's what Jesus is saying. So you see, Peter is a DIY guy, Thomas is a doubting type of guy, and then the third person speaks up, and this is Philip, and he's got a third issue, and the third issue is we need more information. Have you ever felt this? You ever said to yourself, look, it'd just be great if we had more information? I just want a vision or a miracle, something that'll help me, I just want to get past the walk by faith, I want an experience. It's interesting, isn't it, that um, Philip would say this, given that he's just watched Jesus turn the water into wine and um, feed the crowd and heal the blind man and bring Lazarus out of the tomb, and he says, we'd like more information. But of course, we'll never have enough information if we've got that kind of uh, mentality. We need more, we need more, we need more. And what Jesus says is, I've given you exactly enough. I've given you my words and I've given you my works and they are like the two wheels of your bicycle and if you sit on the words and the works, they will take you forward. And you will find, my friends, there'll be certain times in your Christian life where you'll be thinking, I just need more to believe. And Jesus says, says, go back to what I've said and look at it and think about it and go back to what I've done and look at it and think about it because that will be enough for you to keep going forward. So you've got these three guys around the table piping up with their questions and Peter says, we'll solve everything. And Jesus says, I'll solve everything. And Thomas says, nothing will work. And Jesus says, I will do it. And Philip says, we need more information. And Jesus says, I've given you all you need. And he brings it all back to himself again and again. Is this important to us? It is indeed. There'll be certain times and there'll be certain people in this room who'll be the DIY kind of people. You're always thinking that you must solve everything. And you'll need sometimes humbly to come back and say, Jesus Christ, it's you. And there'll be others in the room who are thinking, this is all not going to work. This is all a made up piece of fantasy. And you'll need to come back to Jesus, the integrity and the history of Jesus and you'll say to yourself he is the way and then there'll be other times where you'll be saying I just wish I had more information and Jesus calls you back to what you've got because that will be sufficient so there is Jesus dealing with the three questions around the table and what he's saying is the future is secure because he has prepared our place by dying I go to the cross to prepare a place for you So go back to him when you have the troubles of self-DIY salvation. Go back to him when you feel as though this is never going to work. And go back to him when you think he hasn't given us enough, he shortchanged us. Last uh, two weeks ago, I had a man ring me, a very great man, and uh, he had been the Prime Minister's appointed accountant to see the GST through uh, some years ago. 
a, man, a lovely man called David Voss. And uh, he came to St. Thomas's for 10 years. And I'm sitting at my desk. He's been living in Queensland for a long time. And the phone rings at my desk and I pick it up and he says, it's David Voss here. He said, I don't know if you know, but I'm going home to Jesus. And I said, I didn't know. And he said, uh, three quarters of my liver is cancer. One doctor's given me three days, one doctor's given me three weeks. And then he burst into tears and he said, I just wanted to thank you for telling me and teaching me that I could one day stand before Jesus without fault and with great joy. Does anybody in the room know where those verses come from? Without fault and with great joy? Clergy. Where do those verses come from? It's the very end of the little book of Jude. To him who's able to keep you from falling and present you before his great majesty without fault and with great joy. Anyway, we finished our conversation and we prayed together and I said goodbye. And uh, he died exactly seven days later. But the very wonderful thing is that he will stand before Jesus without fault and with great joy because Jesus went through to the cross. And that's what Jesus is teaching the disciples. Your long-term prospects are perfectly secure. You're going to arrive. You're going to arrive, says Jesus, because I'll die. Because of Good Friday, Easter, every believer will arrive. That's what he says. The telescope goes out. And now the telescope comes back a bit for the second thing, which is preparation for this world. And he begins to give some teaching, which many of you know very well, on the Holy Spirit. And he has five little tutorials. And I wonder if you can follow this. He says this, the Holy Spirit is going to be in you, one. He's going to teach you, two. He's going to lead the mission, three. He's going to convict unbelievers, four and he's going to glorify Jesus. He's going to be in you, teaching, leading, convicting, glorifying Jesus. That's the tutorials in John 14, 15, and 16. Now, when he says in chapter 14, verse 16, I will give you another advocate, there is no word in the English which is the best translation for this Greek word parakletos, which is beside called beside called. And so the translations say, well, 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 we'll do with helper or comforter or paraclete or advocate. But there's no English word that really does justice to the greatness of this advocate or counsellor word. The first advocate, of course, was Jesus. He came alongside. But now he's leaving and the second advocate will come, and this is the Holy Spirit. When Jesus says, I'll give you another advocate, he doesn't mean I'll give you another different kind of advocate, you know, like we would say, I'm going to get another job. He says, I'm going to give you another advocate, similar, like we would say, I'm going to have another coffee. It's the, it's the same type of advocate. God called alongside. So Jesus says in these lovely verses, the Holy Spirit is going to be with you forever. Isn't that a wonderful thing? Remember how David, when he'd sinned, said, oh Lord, don't take your Holy Spirit from me. And Jesus says very clearly to the Christian, when the Holy Spirit comes, he'll be in you forever. You may fall, you may fail, you may sin, you may backslide, and he will be in you forever. Sin and spirit are going to strive in your heart until you meet him. And then sin will be gone. And that's why we should be so grateful that uh, the Holy Spirit comes and doesn't leave. So grateful. Because there are certain times where you think, oh, I've done something so terrible, the Spirit has left. And your distress is proof that the Spirit has not left. That's the wonderful thing about this. And Jesus says he'll be, he'll be in you. So God above in the Old Testament, God beside in the Gospels, God within by his Holy Spirit. 
And my friends, you can't be a Christian without having Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You can't just have the Father and not the Spirit. You can't have Jesus and not the Spirit. You can't have the Spirit and not the Father. In fact, when you become a Christian, you're Trinitarian. As soon as you come to Jesus, you've got a Father in heaven, you've got a Savior, and you've got the Holy Spirit living within you. And if you want to test whether you've got the Holy Spirit, don't ask, am I a gifted person? Because gifts will not be a good guide. Don't ask, am I bearing the fruit of the Spirit? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, humility, faithfulness, self-control. That'll be a very depressing test. <laughs> but ask yourself, in the words of Romans 8, do I call out to God as my Father? Romans 8, 15, because if you do, that's the work of the Spirit. And ask yourself, in the words of 1 Corinthians 12, 3, do I call out to Jesus as Lord? Because if I do, that's the work of the Spirit. So how do you know the Holy Spirit lives in you? It's because in your private moment, in your bedroom, you speak to God genuinely as your Father and you call to Jesus genuinely as your Lord. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. That's the first great tutorial on the Holy Spirit. He will be in you forever. Very wonderful. The second immeasurable benefit in verse 26 is that he's going to teach you and bring peace when Jesus says he will teach you all things, he doesn't mean that the Holy Spirit will teach you on the day of your exams everything you need to get through the exam. He doesn't mean the Holy Spirit will teach you brain surgery or car maintenance. But what he means is that he'll teach you all things that Jesus has said to us, all that he has said. Now, of course, this is primarily to the, to the apostles because Jesus is talking to the eleven. Judas has left and Jesus says the Holy Spirit will come and he will teach you 11 all things and that's of course why the New Testament could be written because the disciples were as slow as we are we forget everything that's why you need a tennis ball with a pen and a text I mean I'm going to drive home and think what was I talking about at the talks was it Galatians or Philippians we forget everything and uh, Jesus says to the apostles, the Holy Spirit is going to come and he's going to help you remember everything and he's going to help you record everything. And the apostles, of course, were prompted by the Spirit to write the Gospels and write the letters. And that's why we have the New Testament. So here he is in the upper room commissioning the New Testament. Um, the disciples, I'll just give you three examples of how slow they were. It says in John chapter 2 that they didn't understand it when Jesus said, destroy this temple and I'll raise it in three days. They didn't understand that, John chapter 2, but after the Spirit came, they understood what he was talking about. When he rode on the donkey into Jerusalem, we read in chapter 12, they didn't understand what he was doing. But when the Spirit came, they understood a king on a donkey great, humble. And in chapter 20, when they arrived at the tomb, they didn't understand that he'd risen from the dead. But of course, when the Holy Spirit came, Acts chapter 2, the apostles were absolutely ready to die for the truth of the resurrection. Now, that's primarily Jesus speaking to the apostles, but of course, the Holy Spirit does also teach us things. And that's why we need to pray often, not only for the preacher, that he'll be helpful, but also for the listeners, that they will be good learners and be taught. Uh, the great prayer of John Stott, the great preacher in the UK, used to go like this, Heavenly Father, we bow in your presence. May your word be our rule and our guide. Your Holy Spirit, our teacher. And your glory, our supreme concern. Your Holy Spirit, our teacher. And he does teach us. He illumines us as we read the word and as we join a Bible study and as we turn up on Sundays. So we must pray for this. Uh, I'm in a church in the eastern suburbs, which a few years, years ago was very, very small. It's not much bigger. But the, the members, many of the members of the church are incredibly deaf, not just physically, spiritually deaf, spiritually dull, spiritually dead, spiritually disinterested. And they desperately need the Holy Spirit to illumine 
I've been going around visiting them and uh, many of them don't believe and they don't want to believe. That's how hard it is. So we need the work of the Holy Spirit. And Jesus immediately says that he will teach you and give you peace. And I don't know if you've ever noticed that there is a link between teaching, truth and peace. You know what it's like when you're waiting for tests from the doctor and then he rings and says all is well and the truth and the peace come together? You know what it's like when you're waiting for exam results and the exam results come and perhaps there's truth and peace? Um, you know, imagine if you're travelling to the dentist and you hate the dentist. I mean, the dentist is nice, but you hate going to the dentist. And you get on the bus and the person beside you says, where are you going? And you say, I'm going to Dr. Payne, the dentist. And they say, oh, Dr. Payne was hit by a bus this morning. And this great sense of peace comes <laughs> over you because you suddenly feel, well, this is what a relief. This is so great. So um, truth and peace, they often go together and the truth of Christ often will bring us peace. Uh, peace which is, of course, with God, vertical. Peace which is with his people, more and more. And peace in the heart, the truth of God. Well, that's probably what we should say about those first two. Um, he does say in verse 28 that, just for your interest, he's returning to the Father who is greater... This has often been a tricky verse for people. What Jesus means, of course, is that God the Father is greater in authority. He, Jesus has come under the will of the Father. And also, of course, God the Father is greater in the glory, which Jesus looks forward to returning to. And then he says at the end of chapter 14, the devil is approaching and uh, he has no power, of course, on Jesus. He cannot hold on to Jesus. Jesus is innocent. The devil cannot really control him. But the devil is coming. And uh, Jesus says in verse 31, a remarkable verse, but I must go ahead with the cross because, can anyone see what it says in 1431? I must go ahead with the dying on the cross, says Jesus, because I love the Father. Isn't that interesting? Why did Jesus die on the cross? Oh, it's because he loved me. Yes, that's true. But he primarily died on the cross because he loved the Father and uh, was wanting to do the will of the Father. And of course, he wasn't being forced to do the will of God. He says in John 10, I, nobody makes me do this. I lay my life down of my own accord. Now, with that little introduction, everybody, all I've tried to say to you is that Jesus puts the telescope out and says, the future is secure because I'm going to die. You will live. And then he brings the telescope back and he says, the Holy Spirit will come. Yes, he will. As soon as you put your faith in Jesus, you have a Father in heaven, a Saviour, and the Holy Spirit living within you. And the Holy Spirit will be in you forever. And he will teach you. He will help you to grow. And he will give you his peace with God, knowing that you are God's, with one another. He will help and he will also give you peace in your own heart. And then in chapter 15, we're just going to look at these early verses because he says, now I want you to stick close. And the remarkable thing about John 15 is he talks about being the vine and where the branches is that Jesus says, do you realize we're going to be closer than ever? So the apostles say to him, don't leave. We don't want you to leave. And he says, I'm going to leave and we're going to be closer than ever. You're going to be a branch in the vine can anyone remember the I am's in John's Gospel? There's seven of them. This is the seventh and the last. Can anyone remember the first one? I'll give you a clue. It's got to do with the feeding of the 5,000. I am the, the bread. Very good. The second one's got to do with the uh, healing of the blind man. I am the light of the world. Very good. The third one has got to do with um, being the shepherd. But before he says, I'm the shepherd, he says, I am the the gate or the door. Very good. You enter in and then he shepherds you. And then what are we up to? That's four. And then the fifth one is uh, the raising of Lazarus. I am the resurrection. And then the sixth one is with the one we've just seen with Thomas. I am the, the way, the truth and the life. Very good. And now we come to the seventh 
which is that I'm the vine. It's a very clever illustration, because how do you illustrate that there is going to be a new life in you, which is going to be, as it were, God's life in you, Christ's life in you, vine, branches. It's a fantastic illustration. And you'll notice that Jesus doesn't say, you're going to be the fruit bearers, because it's all up to you now. No, no, Jesus says, I'm the vine, I will bear the fruit through you. So you may remember that the Israelites in the Old Testament were called God's vine, and they were hopeless and didn't bear fruit, and now you may be tempted to think, well, we, the church, will do the deed and solve the problem, and Jesus says, no, the people of the Old Testament failed, and you would fail. But I am the vine, and you are the branches, and I'm going to bear fruit through you. Now, in this chapter 15, Jesus teaches that we have three relationships, one with him, branch to vine, one with the other believers, and we'll see that next talk, and the other is our witness to the unbelieving world. I love this chapter because life is very complicated. Are there not certain times where you wake up in the morning and you think, I have too many things to think about and I have too many things to do and I don't even know where to begin? And John 15 says, stay close to Christ, try to love his people and try to be a good witness to the world. So straightforward. Walk with Christ, try to love his people, try to be a witness in the world. And you can't pick and choose from the three. You can't say, I'll walk with Christ, but I won't walk with his people. You can't say, I go to church, but I don't know Jesus. You can't say, I'm going to be a great witness, but I don't belong to church. The sequence is very important, and the sequence is necessary, because it's as we stick close to him, we become more useful in the church, and probably more helpful in the world as well. So it's a very appropriate picture. The new life of Christ is going to be in his people like branches in a vine. And this is Jesus' answer to God's purposes. This is where Jesus is going to do what we could never do on our own. So we're branches in the vine. He tells us that God is the Father who cuts and prunes, which sounds pretty terrible, except uh, what it means is that um, there'll certainly be the removing of a person like Judas, but there'll also be the pruning of people like you and me in order that we will be more fruitful. And pruning, by definition, is painful. And sometimes it could be testing, it could be deep water, it could be trouble, it could be sadness, it could be sickness designed by God to make us closer with him and more fruitful in his purposes. We're not exactly told what the fruit is, but we're told in verse 8 that it will bring glory to God, and we're told in verse 16 that it will last forever. So do you think as you stick close to Jesus through the day as best you can, that will bring glory to God? It will, and it will last forever. Do you think as you love the believers in the church that that will bring glory to God? It will and that relationship will last forever. And do you think that uh, as you seek to be a witness to the world, that will bring glory to God? It will. And God willing, some of those lost people will be around forever. So uh, his call to us in 15, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, is to abide, that's the old word, or remain, or we might say stick close, or lean in to Christ. You wake up in the morning, if you're like me, your head is a mess, your heart is in reverse, and you have to deliberately in the morning say, this is what I pray, I've got a little prayer beside my bed. <laughs> Heavenly Father, thank you for a new day, a day of opportunities, privileges, challenges, responsibilities and battles. Please overrule all things for your glory and for my godliness. Amen. That's my way of putting the gear stick into first gear. And uh, we've got to lean into Christ at the beginning of the day, not back away, lean in, abide, walk with Christ. And um, when he says to us that um, 
we are to abide or lean in or something like that. He's not saying this is going to be the secret of your relationship because that's been won at the cross. He says this is going to be the secret of your fellowship. You know what it's like to be watching a couple and they're married but they're not happy. They've got relationship but they've not got good fellowship. And Jesus is saying, look, you've got relationship, you're a branch in the vine, but you need to have good fellowship because my love is extended towards you and yours needs to be extended to me. Walk with me, says Jesus. And um, when we uh, lean in, we find ourselves growing in fellowship. How do we actually grow the relationship? He says in verse 7, By listening to his words and by speaking words to him. It's not rocket science, is it? You ever been with those people who never say anything or give anything away? It's hard to really know what to do, isn't it? And then there's the opposite, the person who never stops talking. It's hard to know what to do, isn't it? I went to visit an old lady in the church where I am and I said to her, do you ever read your Bible? She said, no, but I say a prayer before I fall asleep. And I said to her, do you like people who talk at you but never listen to you? She looked a bit stunned. But that's the way a lot of people treat God, isn't it? I'm not listening to you. I'm not interested in what you say. But, you know, you're the great ambulance in the sky and I'll tell you what to do every now and again. And Jesus says, no, no, take in my words, 15.7, and speak up your words, and the fellowship will grow. And dear brothers and sisters, you've got to find ways to make your Bible reading enjoyable. So don't beat yourself up and don't burden yourself. It would be better for you to have a one-minute read of one verse than to put it off for six months because you thought you needed to have an hour of some torture Look on it as a privilege to have something said to you by God. And when it comes to your prayer time, think about how that is also a huge privilege and should be a pleasure. So don't beat yourself up about your prayer time. It would be much better for you in the morning to pray the Lord's Prayer and mean it than for you to put off praying for days and weeks and then wonder why you're drifting all over the place. Take in the word 15.7, speak up your word 15.7. So we need to find ways to love these things, the reading and the praying, and this, of course, will help us in our leaning in. So there we are, there's the first talk. Um, I've talked about the telescope out, security for the believer long term, and I've talked about the telescope in, every provision for the believer in the present. I'm tempted to read you something, but I've run out of time. Have I run out of time? (laughs) And uh, I seem to have lost it, so that solves the problem. (laughs) I thought I had brought something very useful to read, but it seems to have slipped away. Um, Yes, so I will stop, and that's probably providential.